Are you unable to concentrate on the tasks at hand? Do you need help focusing more or leveling up your game? Here's a tip. Try Cognizant Citicoline, clinically studied to support mental energy, focus, memory, and attention. Cognizant supports brain health and supplies the brain with the energy it needs to stay sharp. Cognizant is a leading nootropic featured in over 200 products. This podcast is powered by Cognizant. Visit Cognizant.com to learn more and find a product to help you fuel your day. Ready to achieve great heights? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to Power Your Performance, the podcast where we dive deep with leaders in the gaming world and beyond and learn the techniques they use to power their lives. I am your host, Gary Kleinman. Power Your Performance, powered by Cognizant. Welcomes Angela Bernhardt. The, the, I won't say the queen of gaming because that's probably just totally politically inappropriate, but, <laughs> but, right. the, but an experienced uh, guru f- over a very long period of time. Where did that fir- welcome, first of all, uh, from Hawaii? Look at that. That's a I long am. way away from when I first met you in New York. You, you got, I am. You, you, sure is. You ran away from the, from the snow. I did. I could never get used to the cold. I don't, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. So where did the passion from ga- uh, for gaming come from? Well, that's interesting that you ask. And hi, Gary. Great to see you. It's, it's been several many it's been years. It's been a while. I think last time we saw each other, we were, we met in California. I remember with my friend, Mark Scarpa. That is we, true. We met and talked about doing some business then. And you and I have always sort of tracked in the same circle. Um, and so we'll continue because there's some things yeah. coming up. We'll talk about that. Uh, well, we don't talk, we'll talk o- offline about some products that Skin's coming up with that is great for collegiate and what you're doing okay. in eSports U um, with, with uh, Ray Cass and the team. Ray, Ray and I yes. go, go back you, to a oh, golf tournament do. many years ago with a fellow by the name of Steve Gunderson that he will remember. Okay. Yeah. And that's got to go oh, back. Ray's an avid golfer. Yes. I we, mean, we, I think we yeah. played in two annual tournaments that Mr. Gunderson sponsored where he'd have 30 to 60 guys from all around the world in the media space playing um, golf for days upon days. Yeah. The, the good old days. All of his uh, leadership um, analogies revolve around golf. <laughs> I think my... <laughs> What revolves around my golf games that don't play enough recently yeah. is the Arbor Society coming after me. You know, there's very way too many trees and places that uh, I don't believe they should be planted. But yeah. nevertheless, He's great, uh, and we'll we'll get into esports you um, yeah. later. But yeah, so the passion. Um, I mean, I I think that's just a great way to define it. I think that is the root of most all entrepreneurs that I've ever met is that like really intense level of passion. And, um, I, I, I got kind of steered into gaming. I would say around 2014, um, I'd been working on a documentary with a a friend of mine and And he and another partner decided to start a company called Gameco. And um, I don't know if you know of Gameco, but Gameco is the inventor of the video game gambling machine. Okay. So the idea was to create a slot style cabinet of which you could gamble on playing video games. And this would be the replacement for slot machines in the casinos since all of the customers were aging and all the casinos wanted to bring in a younger audience. So this was sort of the solution to that. And they're still operational today. Um, And when he started that, um, he said, well, we also need an agency uh, because we need to like activate esports events um, inside the casinos. And so he asked me to come on and, and 
be part of the team there too. And we ended up starting the Gamer Agency, which by the way, I've always thought was the coolest name ever. <laughs> no um, question. Yeah, to be in the in the gaming space and get to be called the Gamer Agency. Especially when you did it. Exactly. And so um, we uh, teamed up and we started that and, and we did a couple of things in casinos. I think we were still a little early um, to, to really be effective there, but ultimately we ended up getting Microsoft as our lead client. And that led to probably one of my favorite projects of all time, which was, you know, doing the helping with the tech design build operations, hiring talent, staffing and everything for what ultimately became the Microsoft Mixer Studio. When we started, it was just the Microsoft Esports and Gaming Studio in the flagship store in Manhattan at 5th and 53rd and very beautiful old historical building there. It was a, it was a gorgeous facility on the what, second and third floor, right? Yeah. Did you, you, you went? I, we, yeah, I was, I, I was in there uh, when we were recording um, certain content. We were looking at using the space because I believe after you left, it became dormant. That's this is true. And, and you and well, you had I know I, <laughs> what I know. What can I say? <laughs> uh, you know what? I, you, you know you, you you can't take the quarterback out and hope somebody's there to pass. Uh, you know, yeah. And and you had, if my memory serves me correct, you had produced hordes of pilots for them. That that yeah. I mean beyond hordes that yeah. they just couldn't figure out what to do with them. Yeah. So that was the funnest part of it is actually having someone, you know, finance a content studio and to be able to hire talent. We had full time talent in the studio and actually, you know, we we moved Golden Boy uh, from California uh, to New York, back to New York. His his wife was from New York, so he was very happy to move back and we had Jess Brohard and Future Man and a couple of other talent that we brought on, but we had so much time on our hands. All we did was make pilots, make original content. And honestly, I, I hope that someday somebody, I, I would love to do it, pulls it out of the vault. I've still never seen content quite as like as exciting and engaging as this i mean we did a variety show for games well i remember i mean i remember all the content yes. and, and and it was fantastic content and i guess my question to you because you're close to uh the brain trust to the extent that there was a brain trust at microsoft and gaming at the time is how do you not attempt to distribute and monetize it especially if you're microsoft it's not like you're on a shoestring budget and it, it just seems to me to be dumbfounding that they they didn't do anything with that incredible mm -hmm. content. Yeah, and you know, in general, um, you know, Microsoft has very deep pockets. Um, they like to try a lot of things. Um, you know, sometimes they try them for a while and decide, hey, that's not our priority anymore. Um, but essentially, it's kind of the inside story on that is that at the foundation of it, um, Xbox and Microsoft Retail are really two very separate entities, and they almost they operate very siloed. And so there was always sort of a push and pull between Xbox, who creates all of Microsoft's content. And then Microsoft Retail creating all of this new sort of gaming content. Well, who owned it? Where did it live? Who really has the rights to that? And so, um, unfortunately, it just never got to come to the forefront because there was, you know, so much negotiations going on. But it's great content. I still have all of it. I still get, you know, thank yous from the talent that we had working there because I think I was really one of the first people in the space to pay talent really, really well. So unfortunately it's turned back on me now because when I need talent, I know the prices I have to pay them. 
Isn't that the, isn't that the truth? All, all of the talent was paid very well to be in that studio and work in, you know, 10 yeah, Which is interesting because now there's plenty of channels of distribution for that content um, as, as long as it's content not stale, which if it's mm-hmm. variety and it's gaming, the, the chances are it's got some evergreen halo to it, if you pardon the, the, the pun. Um, and there's plenty of places in, uh, that would love that content to still put out there. Well, there you go. And I'm a producer at heart. And, um, you know, we, what we wanted to do with golden boy, he was going to be the Jimmy Fallon of gaming and esports, And we did several pilots around that, that are like just right on the money. So who knows? We're all still friends. Maybe it comes back full circle, you know? Do you, do you miss the production side? Well, I'm, I'm still doing production. I've got, I've, I actually set up a small studio here in, on Oahu. Oh, good. So, I didn't realize that. And, yeah, and, oh, that's great. So are you doing that as part of eSports Shoe or is that, that's. Yes. So, so, yeah. so tell me about eSports U and its mission, okay. because I think with eSports and what have you, I, to me in, in the world in which I live in, Collegiate esports is probably, if not the heart of it, it it's it's pretty central to the success of gaming. I would say so as well, and um, yeah. So the 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 studio here is you know part of the initiative that we've built. Esports U is a uh, subsidiary of Collegiate Sports Management Group. And that's where you know Ray, Ray and Mike from right. the two co-founders there. Both of them come from a sports media and entertainment background. Um, you know, Mike ran um, Westwood One. Uh, you know, Ray's worked at the NFL and OMD, and so these guys are deeply rooted in sports media broadcast um, and. The business model of, of the company now is they represent conferences on both the traditional sports side and the esports side. They represent their property rights and they uh, monetize them through um, sponsorship, sales, media rights, naming right. rights. They offer all sorts of different services, valuations. We do white label production work. So when I came on board, um, what they really wanted me to do was, because of my experience in production, was um, take an event um, that they wanted to run, an annual event, and um, really elevate the broadcast around it. Just make it like best in class. Put high-end graphics, hire the best technical directors, hire the best talent to do that. Um, and we did that very successfully. That was in uh, 2021. Yeah, time time's it going doesn't. by fast here. But yeah. Um, and so when I came on, you know, I had never been really involved in collegiate sports or collegiate esports for that matter. And um, I just, I took a look at the space and one of the first exercises that I did was I had I had the team put together a calendar of all the collegiate esports conferences and leagues that were out there, like their regular season play and their playoffs. And I had them put it all on a calendar. And when you crossed all these schedules over together, it was like sheer chaos. Like there's there, it was, and, and a lot of people have used the word fragmented for collegiate esports, And I, I, I wouldn't say it's fragmented. I would say more, it's like got a lot of different layers to it and a lot of different players in it. So when I saw that, you know, I said, well, we need to unify this group in some way. And so what, what I did was I just started calling up commissioners of these conferences and I said, Hey, we're going to do this event and we'd love to, for, you know, your playoff winner, your season champion to play into our event. 
And so they loved the idea. Um, you know, Mike was ready and willing to put, to invest in a live event. Live events are very expensive. Right. They're not cheap. Um, that's why you don't see a lot of them at the college level because they are they are expensive. So what we did was we formed the Collegiate Esports Commissioner's Cup. And um, we held a big event in Atlanta this year at the Gateway Center Arena. Uh, Atlanta gave us an amazing welcome, amazing market to do an event. And Todd Harris was our production partner there at Skillshot. Um, we had 64 teams, the best collegiate teams across the country, playing in from 14 different conferences. So this is the first time, you know, anything like that had ever, ever been done. And uh, just amazing, the, 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 the student athletes, the players, the competitors, like we literally rolled out a red carpet. We bought a red carpet and rolled out a red carpet for them. And we gave them media day and we gave them press and we interviewed them and we gave them customized jerseys with all our brands on there. We had about 10 different uh, uh, blue chip brands in there, McDonald's, Morgan Stanley, Air Force, um, amazing you know, support, Microsoft, CDW amazing support from brands. So, you know, this is an IP that we just really wanted to develop and build something like this, you know, similarly thinking to an ESL model, you right. know, build, build intellectual property around events. And so we started that, we love it, very successful. And that's just kind of one, one part of what we're doing. So, it was, and that was streamed? Oh yeah, stream streamed on Twitch. We have our own Twitch channel. Um, it's the Esports U Twitch channel. Uh, and, and that's sort of kind of another initiative that we have here is during the regular academic season, we stream about 10 hours a day of the best college esports matches out there. So we are, we are heavily, we're, we're in the top point five percent of streaming channels on twitch within like a year um, of course that's that great. puts us at like number sixty nine thousand or something like well, that but that's what i'm saying i think collegiate esports is, is the heartbeat of where esports is i i think in many yeah. ways it is more critical for that to be a success than the franchise model on the traditional esports side so to be if there's such a thing as traditional esports but you know on 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 mm -hmm what everybody reads about esports, that I do think that what you're doing with, with colleges is, one is aspirational for the, the high schoolers that want to go and play, and it yeah. lays the foundation for the future. So it's really the crossroads of where everybody needs to be um, with a built-in audience, per se, from affinity to college. Absolutely, and, and we really view it um, you know, as the future of business um, and how businesses are changing and how technology and, you know, Web 3.0 and the metaverse and, and all of that will change future businesses. What you're really looking at here is the future, you know, workforce and, and entrepreneurs of how life is going to change. Right. And, and, and so a lot of, you know, the, the purpose of this podcast is to talk about health and wellness within the esports world. So, as you look at the collegiate environment, how important is health and wellness? Is it being discussed? Is it a back burner? Is it an education issue? Where do you think health and wellness fits in in your space? I mean, I I think it's very important. I I think in general this generation is much more sort of balance minded um, than any other generation before that. I mean, work life, school balance is very, very important. Um, you know, and of course, you know, I think esports, the conversation has really come to the forefront, you know, around a lot of hate speech and, and trash talk you know, on, on Twitch is part of that. It's just not healthy. Um, you know, and I, I think a lot of these uh, 
student athletes are very aware that they need to eat well, they need to get the right amount of sleep. One of the things that we're doing with one of our brand partners is creating um, access through our Discord for us to have conversations around health and wellness directly with the students that you know compete in the conferences and, and in our uh, tournaments that we hold. And so it's, it's, I think it's very vital. Yeah. Yeah, because the, the, the image first. is always Doritos, Red Bull, uh, highly caloric, kind of not nutritional and, and um, deprivation of sleep, focus issues, and, <laughs> and then the pain of extended uh, gaming sessions and head, neck, back, hands, and, and thumbs. And, and I hope, you know, that's what, what we work on is to raise the level of knowledge and communication about it and make uh, mm. some good decisions because people are gaming so much so early, it is having impact later in life as they kind of age out in the collegiate world and, and have families and, and have the, the residue of some bad gaming habits and personal nutrition habits. Exactly. Um, Do you have kids? Do I? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there you go. Yeah. You, you know it very well then. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, I think, you, and you, you probably find the same thing. The older we get, uh, the kids think we're smarter. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when they were young, they certainly didn't want to listen to much of anything. And as my kids are having exactly. kids, they're certainly saying, oh, really? Now, now I kind of sort of get it. So, so I think for the most part, part my, my kids grind. A lot of kids still grind, you know, playing video games. Um, at night, a little bit of that model has changed now, but for the most part, I, I think people are more health conscious about how they eat and how they sleep and taking care of themselves. And I think that the program directors inside the colleges, it's very important for them to drive that home as well. And yeah, and I think they're starting to, and, and certainly yeah. the administrators that, that we speak with um, are, are looking at that, and especially the esports coaches since a lot of the sports coaches have um, professional sports experience that they're yeah. used to nutritionists and they're used to Pilates and stretching and what have you and are mandating that in, in their, their um, collegiate programs. Mm -hmm. So exactly. where's the future of collegiate esports? And I know we have a short time frame, and I want, I want to be respectful of that. So, um, no worries. I no I, worries. We're good. Yeah, we're good. I, I don't want you missing any flights because of, of, of me. Well, weather's okay. I don't want to be the cause of it. But where is the future of collegiate esports, both from what you're doing and, and generally the state of the art, so to speak? So I would say what, what we're doing in college esports is pretty much the same thing that every other uh, league operator or conference is doing we're trying to garner those brand sponsorships um the one thing that is really missing to check the box here for brands is viewership um yeah i was going to ask you what what are what are the metrics what are the data points um yeah that, that brands light. are looking for they're still light you know um we're working on some programs now where we'll be able to guarantee viewership numbers and um, we're going to start implementing that this fall and we're also working on many many levels of you know building college esports fandom uh similar to how it is in, in college sports we're about to um, do one of our first live regional events we're holding that at Rutgers. We're doing it the same weekend that um, Rutgers is playing Michigan and football. So the whole campus will be lit up. We're cross promoting our events. Um, we're doing NIL deals with basketball players from Rutgers that are gonna come and play the Rocket League, Rocket League team um, at Rutgers. Then on Sunday, we have some of the football players coming over after, you know, after the football game on Saturday, 
come over on Sunday, they're going to play Super Smash Brothers Ultimate. Um, we work very closely with like the communications department of every university that we go into. Um, and also we'll do things like advertise on the, on the university's website, banner advertising, newsletter. We really try to create, you know, a, a cross promotional environment here because we believe that the students that go to watch the football game are the same ones that want to come and, and watch uh, gaming. And so um, we're just making it more accessible and and more engaging for students to want to come. So is that. it similar then in following the model that traditional stick and ball did to build fan affinity and and just kind of absolutely apply it? And don't don't underestimate, you know, food and beverage and merchandise. Oh, um, without a doubt. It's still there. You it, know? Is is there an outreach to alumni because i guess you know if the average age of a gamer is 37 um right exactly and, and you've got alumni that are substantially younger that have graduated and probably still gaming in 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 many respects when they're stationed in life still gaming with a passion uh, is there much impact or reach out to the alumni to participate oh yeah uh, alumni and and even high school middle school um, we we try to organize bus trips, you know, um, so high school students can come. Um, alumni is a very Im important part of what we do. We've been talking with one of our partners, ECAC, uh, for a long time now about starting an alumni league. It's only natural that it happens. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 traditional sports, you know, all over again with esports, and we've got to check all of those boxes, and you know, and it's it's marketing and building excitement and the right food and the right merchandise. Get the merchandise looking looking right, you know. You know, if if the Cultural. ultimate if the Cultural. ultimate goal for funding are the brands, which they obviously are, because that's true in stick and ball sports. What, what I always found interesting when I was in that space was the brands would spend a fair amount of money for the sponsorship and do very little activation to support mm -hmm. the sponsorship, right? So th yeah. th they'll slap their name on a tournament, but they won't do an activation at the tournament or they won't do sampling mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Do you find that to be the same as you're building the brand alliances that they're somewhat open to sponsorships and then they go well you just tapped out our budget and we don't have any money for activation well um i i think the brands um love you know getting in front of college students and they love the live event you know they like they like the broadcast but you're right they don't always want to activate at the event but what i found that they do want is all of these brands need content. So they want to some way use, utilize the content that's created, you know, around an event or around a tournament as, as their own content and sort of refine it and finesse it. So it's in line with their brand messaging and their values. And, and that's what we really see that brands want now. They want content. Everybody wants content. Yeah, everybody wants content. But the interesting thing with the content, especially in esports, I, I believe, uh, uh, as opposed to getting to stick and ball sports, is that the esports content has to be incredibly authentic and real for the yeah. esport audience. And so many of these brands I see go in there and they go, we just want to be in front of that audience and don't spend the time or ask the right questions to make that um, authentic. Mm -hmm. I agree. Authentics probably has been the most overused word. I, I agree with that. I, day one, right? Uh, everybody, everybody wants it to be authentic, but it's true. And, and, and that's not just a cliche. It really has to be that way. I mean, some of the best content that our, our brands 
have enjoyed is, you know, on the spot content made right at the event. It's very organic. It's very natural. And um, I, I, you know, I think that's what they're finding resonates with them is a lot of that live content. Yeah, there's there's no question, and now there's more places for them to put it because they all want to be on TikTok, and and repurpose that and Twitch and I don't know some I think are still doing Snapchat depending on the week. I hear they're putting yeah. it on Snapchat, and then I hear that they're not. So I'm looking for a brand right now that wants to do sort of a, a road trip, um, you know, in in one of these these big eighteen wheelers that's sort of like a gaming center. And, um, you know, I'm looking for a brand that wants to do that, going from our event starting in uh, May 2023, and then go the road to CECC and do like a tailgate run all the way up to the next big event. I mean, that's fun, engaging. What, what more content could you ask for? How much more organic could you get? Pull up and host a tournament, you know, on campus. So have you found in that conversation that brands are saying, I get the esports, I get the college, um, we're still at the, I'm putting my toe in the water space as opposed to uh, doing yeah. a half gainer into the pool? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of them still are. You know, when you start getting brands like uh, McDonald's and, and Microsoft and CDW and Barbasol, it does create a little bit of, a ripple effect you know other brands say oh they're doing it let's try it a little too yeah but it's, a, it's that found, fomo and yeah. sponsorship the fear of missing out that if mcdonald's is there i burger king better better get in the mix and be as part of the conversation even though they don't know what the conversation they're getting into actually is exactly and you know i i think also too brands realize that you know those you know, future consumers or current consumers that are there, um, you know, they they want to create affinity with them in a very real way. And I think all of these uh, student athletes and fans that see brands putting money into, you know, a spectacular event, um, I mean, that means something to them because, you know, this is their game. You know, this is their passion, their pastime. And when they see brands, you know, footing the bill for, you know, some of these big events that they get to go to, I can tell you that it has, it has warmed my heart on many, many occasions when I see these students show up and, you know, competitors that they've been playing online against all year, they get to come and meet in person. I mean, there is such an electricity in the air and just sheer excitement. These, you know, it'd be like being on a basketball team and never actually being able to, to go to an arena and play basketball. You know, these, these young people, they want to get on a stage. They want to be on camera. They want to have pro talent casting their plays. You know, they want to have a, a cool host hosting their event. You know, it's exciting. Oh, without so, a doubt. I mean, it, yeah. it, anyone that hasn't been to a live esports event, um, mm -hmm. it's almost impossible to believe that that's what goes on, right? If you if you were to close your eyes, you would think you had an NBA event, right? I mean, the screaming yeah. and yelling is the totally. same. The merch is the same. Um, I actually think the one of the differences is the community in the gaming space, the esports space is substantially stronger than mm -hmm. it is in, in the non-gaming space. It Because games are transient, the communities are not. They continue to thrive and, yeah. and grow even though their game of choice might change. And I think that's a phenomenal opportunity for all of collegiate esports because it doesn't really matter the game per se as long as it's competitive and enjoyable. But the community and the college affinity has as true emotional connection. Yeah. Community is, is really still everything. Without our community, we don't have anything. And, and um, the conversations I've had with a lot of brands, 
they don't seem to grasp that concept of the community mm -hmm. uh, or, yeah. or how to necessarily communicate with that community. And I, and I think some of that, once they learn and they have, and you have examples and case studies of how to do it right, mm -hmm. will open up floodgates for dollars. And with that, you can do good things and expand and, and, and what mm -hmm. have you. Yeah, and I still think we have years of handholding, um, you know, with brands and, and modeling for them and, you know, proving out um, what we believe, you know, college esports is. But we're invested to do that, you know. And, and how supportive both by time and dollars have you found that the um, academic institutions are equally uh, towing the line for their fair share? I think they're starting to. Um, I want to say last year, close to $30 million in scholarships hmm. were giving out last year uh, at the college level. Um, I think you're going to see more dollars go into admissions and recruiting um, you know, which is something that we're very bullish on, uh, working with admissions offices and, and recruiting. And uh, I think you'll see, you know, more funds going in there. Colleges like esports for pretty much three reasons. One, recruiting, recruiting that type of talent. Um, two, enhancing campus life. Uh, it's still a great community to have on campus, gaming and esports. And then three, you know, the opportunity for postgraduate career placements. You know, esports is really just a conduit for a lot of other careers in, in tech and entertainment and broadcast and talent and agency work and, and um, everything. And a, a big part of what we do is we capture two streams every day. One stream we capture and we use professional casters and professional hosts on our stream. Then the second stream we capture is all student led and student run and student casted. So, so it's kind of like the old student radio station on campus. Exactly. exactly. Which, which is fantastic. I think one of the best things that happened to eSports, at least initially, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it's still this way, is that the uh, administration of eSports on campus did not go through the athletic departments and stayed mm -hmm. with the a academics and the STEM, uh, which did two things. One, that was the appropri appropriate place to put it, but it also kept the NCAA and, and their, you know, their, their big mm -hmm. fingers out of the pot. Yeah. I think for the most part, it's still all over the place. Uh, some will have it in academics, some have it in student clubs, some have it in, in the athletic department. Um, every school is different. I think you're at now about around 30% of the programs are in the athletic department. Is, is that growing or shrinking, do you think? I would say it's growing. It's growing to stay in the athletics. And, and I guess the more money that derives from it, uh, that's the push to stay in the athletic departments probably? I guess so. Well, once they, you know, have their, their esports media go through evaluation process and, and they realize that there's a potential value around it, that's growing over time, obviously. Right. right? Um, and as well as sponsorship, local sponsorships around esports are doing very well at colleges. Um, you can look at Maryville, for instance, and Dan Clerkey, who runs that program over there. Uh, a big part of his job is bringing in sponsorships, local sponsorships, and he's doing a very, very good job of that. And other folks like um, Doc out at Boise State University, um, you know, not only are they getting in sponsorships, they're doing white label production work for amateur and pro leagues right out of their esports arena and their studio at Boise State. So different universities are finding different ways to monetize the program as well. I mean, you would think um, locally, and I know we're going to have a conversation shortly on, on the esports arena side with a few of your colleagues, um, but local is, is certainly um, 
a wonderful place for esports because, again, you, you get the entire community that not only can watch, but they can participate. Whereas in yeah. stick and ball sports, you know, the local community is not putting on pads and helmets, but they can um, compete in, mm-hmm. in, in a game. Yeah, I think local and regional sponsorships is is key. It's one of the key ways to help keep these programs sustainable. And if I understand even the business model, you, the organization uh, does not deal with D1 schools? Is it mostly the smaller no, we, schools? No, we deal, we, we deal with Division I do you schools. Okay. But yeah, but um, Mike and Ray, they mostly, you know, started out, um, filling a void in the D2 and D3 schools. So they started out with a majority of, um, you know, conferences. They, they represent 23 conferences on the traditional sports side. Um, and we, we we're only at, at five right now on the esports side, but those five add up to about 500 universities that we represent now. Um, so- And if you, you know, look at, if you take that and you look at the student body count on those 500, your reach Absolutely. to people is pretty significant. Absolutely. We've just got to unlock that, <laughs> that magic. For- well, There's so many magic formulas, you know, we need to figure out. And, well, and if, everybody if, in this space is doing that, you know, if, but that that's part of pioneering. That's well, part if, of if anyone can do it, it, it's you. And I think with that, especially for brands, you you have access to an enormous amount of data. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and data ultimately is what everybody wants, whether the data is eyeballs yeah. or it's conversions or it's brand sentiment or whatever that, that, that they're looking for at any given time. Um, the, the use of that data and the accessibility to that data with even 500 universities and colleges is pretty significant. Exactly. I mean, we've, we've got our own built in focus groups for brands. As which is well. great and, and and you can sample not even uh you can do that digitally you you can mail it you can hand them something so even from the traditional sampling that you know i've been doing for years experientially um it it, it it's a phenomenal thoroughfare to introduce yes. or solidify your brand to uh what you might believe is your target market exactly and therefore my tailgate party <laughs> yeah. sampling at our tailgate party you know it's um uh, it's a funny thing a tailgate uh and all, all the gaming's indoors so that we got to come up with another phrase for you know the, yeah. the, the tailgate i'm not quite sure what it is and uh but it'll that, be outside it'll be outside it, it'll be outside that that oh yeah so you got to stay with the original passion and now watch it grow from really uh, infancy because, yeah. you know, as you said, it's it's many years down the road to really understand what's going on and to see it reach fruition. I, I think one of the things that I, I see in our space within the gaming is there's so much media attention to gaming mm-hmm. that it raises unrealistic expectations mm-hmm. of yeah. what gaming is supposed to deliver overnight and that's true with numbers games and ultimately monetization and 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 the pressure to continue to reach um the failed expectations of media um really unfortunately are um challenges for everybody in the space Mm -hmm. and it'd be nice if if some of that was just reporting on here it is it's great it's growing that's great Instead of saying, um, you know, the, the controversy with FaZe Clan went, went with the SPAC, you know, the mm-hmm. expectation was just so unrealistic that it didn't matter what they did. Um, and they've held their own, fortunately, but irrespective, the conversation itself put unrealistic expectations um, yeah. instead of just saying, hey, we're at the beginning, we're new, let us, you know, like a baby, you don't have to, the baby doesn't have to walk one month after birth it takes some time to get your feet from underneath you and you can't have unrealistic expectations and i think some of the media and the traditional media um is putting a lot of unrealistic pressure mm-hmm. on the esports yeah. vertical to say well you're not 
doing what you should be doing. But nobody said they should be doing that other than the media. Absolutely. And for us, our philosophy is just steady as we go. We operate very, very lean. Um, we focus on strategic spending where we need to spend based upon our like really passionate convictions of how we really want to grow in the space. And so, you know, we don't, we don't overbuild, we don't overstaff, we don't do any of that. We want to just do what we're doing very well, develop our intellectual properties, continue to build meaningful relationships with the colleges and the conferences and the directors and the coaches and elevate the players, tell the stories around collegiate esports. We've got a show that's going to launch soon. Um, it's, it's going to be a, a network show. Um, I can't give all the information, but, um, we're trying to sort of, you know, think in terms of, you know, some of the original content that maybe came out on ESPN where, you know, traditional sports first came into the household 40 years ago. And, you know, so that's, that's, that's where we're at. You know, um, and our investors believe in that, um, and and they're 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 in for the you know esports is a long haul. It's there's, always there's been no a question. long. It's always been a long game. But the good news is, from you know where I'm sitting, listening to you, is that at least it's being treated as a business, mm -hmm. and and so much of esports has been treated as a game or an activity and not a business, and mm -hmm. therefore. Uh, maybe they overspent and you can look at Venn and the dollars that, that they raised and went through um, in 14 months, which mm -hmm. is, uh, and, and you being in, you know, I'm the setting. game agency or what have you. Can, I'm setting you can, for the industry as you, well. You, you can relate to having those dollars um, and then depleting it in, in 12 months or 14 months without much to show for it. It, it was not treated yeah. as a business. And, and the exactly. revenue side to it versus the cost and everything else, which is, it has to be for sustainability. So it, it's great to hear because I do have conversation through the podcast, you know, with different people and, and that aspect of treating it as a business and that somewhere there's got to be a profit and you got to watch what you spend, uh, irrespective of your investor base, you still for longevity have to look at it as a business. And, and it's great to hear mature adults looking at it that way, because that, that seems to be a unique perspective. Thank you so much. And if there's one thing you can bet on is that it will change. Oh. <laughs> because esports is also a pivot game. So, you which, know, which, which, which is absolutely true. Uh, yeah. I know we got some time issues and I know we have uh, some other people calling in. So thank okay. you. Thank you for Great. this time. We'll, we'll circle you. back in, in a little bit. Um, this forum's always open for you to talk about all the things that you're doing, whatever thank it is that you. you're doing. Um, okay. And we'll talk about some other ways that we might be able to synergistically work together from my brand, not about the podcast and, and continue our conversation. Fabulous. Thank Angela, you, always my pleasure. Great Good to, to see you see after you. all these yeah. years. And Alrighty, I'll see you shortly. All right. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks for listening. This podcast is part of the MAP Esports Podcast Network and produced by Innovation Media Enterprises. Please be sure to leave us a review and follow us on your favorite podcast player.